Why hello there friends, it's Emma here, the Bookish Princess. I have a stack of books here today and I thought we would do a little reading chat and I can tell you about what I've been reading throughout the last month. So if you caught my reading vlog last month, you'll know that I've been enjoying a reread of Dorothy Sayers, who is one of my favorite authors. I did finish rereading Gaudy Night. I started with Strong Poison. I read um, Have His Carcass, which is the second in the Lord Peter and Harriet Bain uh, series, and Gaudy Night is set in Oxford. It is the third in the series. I still have to get to Busman's Holiday. Busman's Honeymoon? Busman's Honeymoon, I think. And I'm thinking I might reread the Lord Peter short stories as well. The short stories are actually how I first was introduced uh, to Lord Peter and Dorothy Sayers, so I feel like they're a pretty good place to start. Lord Peter is basically like Bertie Wooster meets Sherlock Holmes. So this is set in like the 30s and 40s. Uh, Lord Peter is a British peer. He has a manservant bunter who's a lot like Jeeves, um, but Lord Peter loves to solve crime. His two hobbies are collecting old books and solving crimes. When he meets Harriet Vane, those are my favorite, favorite um, stories in the series and Gaudy Knight, all the Oxford, oh my gosh, is so fantastic. And I love how Dorothy Sayers is constantly like sprinkling classical allusions to Shakespeare and other amazing authors um, just so like casually that you almost miss them. Harriet Vane is herself a mystery writer um, and her love of writing and learning kind of reignites when she's at Oxford in Gaudy Knight. And there are just so many beautiful passages, like at one point She's looking out over this beautiful view of Oxford and she's just inspired to write a couplet. She put down a tentative line or two and crossed them out. If the right twist would not come of itself, it was useless to manufacture it. She had her image, the world sleeping like a great top on its everlasting spindle, and anything added to it would be mere verse making. Something might come of it someday. In the meanwhile, she had got her mood on paper. And this is the release that all writers, even the feeblest, seek for, as men seek for love. And having found it, they doze off happily into dreams and trouble their hearts no further. I really like to write. I have countless journals that I'm always keeping and pulling out. And I definitely feel that way sometimes when you're so inspired by the beauty before you. You just want to write something out and like, maybe it's good, maybe it's no good, but like you just had to kind of get it out on paper. The fun thing about Dorothy Sayers is that she's probably most well known for the Lord Peter mysteries, but she also loved theology. I did finally order this book, which has been on my list for ages. It's called Letters to a Diminished Church, Passionate Arguments for the Relevance of Christian Doctrine by Dorothy Sayers. Here's the quote from the back of the book. Somehow or other, with the best intentions, we have shown the world the typical Christian in the likeness of a crashing and rather ill-natured boar. And this is in the name of one who assuredly never bored a soul in those 33 years during which he passed through this world like a flame. Let us, in heaven's name, drag out the divine drama from under the dreadful accumulation of slipshod thinking and trashy sentiment heaped upon it, and set it on an open stage to startle the world into some kind of vigorous reaction. I love how Dorothy Sayers articulates her faith and articulates the problems that she sees in the world, although I have to admit it is also kind of depressing because she's writing, I believe, during World War II, um, around then, and so many of the problems she describes, like, it feels so timely. It feels like we still have those same problems and have not uh, managed to address them. But there's a lot that's inspiring, too. I really loved at the beginning how uh, one of the chapters is called The Image of God. She points out that the author of Genesis did not explain what he meant by the image of God. How, then, can man be said to resemble God? Is it his immortal soul, his rationality, his subconsciousness, his free will, or what that gives him that gives him a claim to this rather startling distinction? A case may be argued for all these elements in the complex nature of man, but had the author of Genesis anything particular in his mind when he wrote, it is observable that in the passage leading up to the statement about man, he has given no detailed information about God. Looking at man, he sees in him something essentially divine, but when we turn back to see what he says about the original, upon which the image of God was modeled, we find only the single assertion, God created. The characteristic common to God and man is apparently that, 
the desire and ability to make things. And I just really love how she talks about that. I mean, it's kind of a similar theme to, um, you know, the, the writing passage that we read out from Gaudy Knight, just this instinct that man has to create, to not just sit back passively and absorb the beautiful things in the world, but to rearrange them into a new pattern. So yes, I'm not quite finished with this yet, but I'm definitely looking forward to diving more into it. I'm not finished with my reread of the Lord Peter mystery series, but I was tempted to buy myself a new Agatha Christie, a new Poirot. The mystery of the blue train takes us to Nice because the blue train is the one that goes to the blue shores, to the blue waters of the Riviera. So it was a pretty great summer read. I love the descriptions of the characters just sitting on their balconies, taking in the ocean. It's kind of funny, a lot of the things that I love most about mysteries are like not the murdery and the crime bits, but like the whole rest of it. And obviously putting together the solution to the crime is fun. Um, but obviously there is a murder uh, in the mystery of the blue train on the train. And in typical Agatha Christie style, you're not sure like who exactly fits into the puzzle where until the very end, there are lots of pieces in play. But mysteries can be such a fun escape. I feel like they really draw you in and like make you and keep you turning the page and keep you wondering um, who exactly did it. And it's funny, I feel like I always forget who did it. I've either read The Mystery of the Blue Train before or I've watched the um, Poirot episode. I love that Poirot series. Although, I went to look it up the other day and I think it wasn't on Netflix anymore. I have to check again. Hopefully they'll add it back. So yes, this is the William Morrow from HarperCollins uh, publication and I just love the style of these covers. So I mentioned in last month's reading vlog that one book I was starting was, I found it on Playbooks, it was actually a free download. It's called The Cloud Dream of the Nine, a Korean novel, a story of the times of the Tangs of China, about 843 AD by Kim Man Chung. In this part that I've just been reading, the hero has passed by this sort of forest glen and he saw a maiden in the window. Um, and the maiden saw him. And so and so the young man like proceeds on to the town, but the maiden has decided she wants to marry him. So she sends her nurse out into the town to find him. And the nurse finds him and says, I shall speak directly to the point. The house you mention is the home of my master, Commissioner Chin, and the lady you for and the lady you refer to is his daughter. From childhood, she has been pure of heart and gifted in mind and soul with a wonderful talent for knowing people. She saw your excellency but once and for a moment, yet her desire is to entrust herself to you forever. This sounds like in, um, you know, Frozen. The commissioner is away from home in the capital and he must needs return before any decision can be arrived at. Most important is the matter, however. And in the meantime, your excellency may be far enough away like the floating seaweed on the drift or the autumn leaves in the wind that blows. Fearing she might never again find you, she has sent me to say that the destiny of life is the all-important subject, while the diffidence of the moment and the fear to speak of it are but a passing unpleasantness. Thus has she, contrary to good form in her bringing up, written, me, written this letter and ordered me, her old servant, to ask your excellent name and place of residence. I really like the language and the way it becomes so like lyrical. Far enough away like the floating seaweed on the drift or the autumn leaves in the wind that blows. I'm really enjoying it and I'm definitely looking forward to finishing it. Another thing I mentioned in last month's reading blog was um, my progress in Duolingo because I am trying to learn um, Korean slowly but surely and I did make it to my 100 day streak. I'm now on 111 days so we'll see how much longer I can keep it up. I've actually been meaning to do a Kindle bookshelf tour because I think that'd be really fun. I have a lot of favorite books that I own as, as ebooks and the two that I recently read were both old favorites that I just absolutely love. The first was Henrietta's War by Joyce Dennis Dennis. Um, these were actually originally written as like short stories, I think for a newspaper during World War II. Um, and the author, Joyce, kind of, kind of mirrored the character Henrietta after herself and after her own experiences, news from the home front, 1939 to 1942. So Henrietta is a housewife, she lives in Devon, and all of these um, short stories are letters that she's writing to a childhood friend of hers, who we never actually get to know very well, but he's obviously in the British Armed Forces fighting uh, in Europe. Henrietta's husband is a doctor, so he has not gone to the front. He's uh, busy with his duties in their town. The world is going through some pretty rough times now, and so to read things that have been written during other thorny patches of history can be really inspiring to kind of help you keep your spirits up and remind you that 
humanity has gone through rough spots before and, and has found the will to make it through. Henrietta's letters to her friend are always filled with like just little fun anecdotes from life in the town and from you know what the neighbors have been doing but it's told in a very humorous way and she's obviously always looking for just like the little things like these little kind of patches of joy or humor. She could have written to her friend all about you know, the privations and the difficulties. Her letters could be full of fear and hopelessness. That wouldn't be surprising considering the time and history she lived through. So it's just kind of inspiring to see her focus on the little things and remind you to focus on the little things, focus on what's within your control. I feel like when things are stressful and difficult in the outside world, it's nice to have some kind of old friends, some old favorite books to turn to, to just give you a breather and help you reset. Two more British books that I reread this month were Bell Lamington by D.E. Stevenson and Fletcher's End, um, which is actually still about the same characters from Bell Lamington. D.E. Stevenson is one of my favorite authors. She also wrote Miss Bunkle's book. She wrote a series um, about a housewife set during World War II, which I'm tempted to reread those as well. That one was the Mrs. Tim series. Um, and it's fun that D.E. Stevenson doesn't just write one story about her characters and like a village and then discard them. She often carries it on. Like the Miss Bunkles book, there are like four, at least four books um, that kind of continue on with those characters in Miss Bunkles' story. Um, and Mrs. Tim has multiple books in that series. It's just so delightful when you're enjoying a book and enjoying some characters that when you get to the end of the novel, you're not done. There's another one to dive into. Like with the Lord Peter uh, and Harriet Vane, Vane books, I really have enjoyed the fact that it's not like it was one and done. There have been multiple to jump into. But yes, Belle Lamington is working as a secretary in London. She works for a shipping firm. Um, it's kind of fun. She obviously enjoys the company she works for. And and the way merchandise from all over the world comes into their wharves and you know gets distributed out again. However, life in the office is not perfect. She has a lot of difficult people to contend with and gets into some very stressful situations. But luckily she has friends who turn up just when she needs it. She goes on a wonderful holiday to Scotland and that's so fun to read about. And then Fletcher's End. Fletcher's End is actually this beautiful historic house. Um, that they, the characters end up renovating and it's really fun to read about that as well. So, so there are some unpleasant people Belle the heroine has to deal with, but there are also some delightful people she meets. And this is a description of a new friend she met. Already they understood each other and had discovered that they had a great deal in common. Chiefly a sense of fun, which is quite a different thing from a sense of humor and more rare. I like that a lot. I think that's true. This one character, Rhoda, feels like she should have a book of her own. I don't think she does. Although at the same time, I'm going to have to Google this to just double check because it feels like there's more of a history on Rhoda that we don't get to, to, to see in, uh, in these books. But one of the quotes I marked was, even Rhoda's most extravagant flights of fantasy contained a good deal of common sense. I like that. The characters are just so delightful in um, these two novels. And another favorite author who I have been revisiting lately is Jane Austen. I've been rereading Pride and Prejudice. It's been the longest since I reread Pride and Prejudice. I always try to space myself out. I don't let myself reread them too often, but it's been quite a while, so revisiting this has been really, really fun. I've been thinking how cool it is the way Jane Austen explores different scenarios in her different novels, but like, those other scenarios, you can see them kind of hovering in the wings. Like in Pride and Prejudice, we have um, the Bennett family, and there are five daughters but no sons, and the estate is entailed away from the daughters, so they won't be able to inherit, but Mr. Collins is going to inherit. And of course, in this book, Mr. Bennett, the father, is alive, so they're all still living in, in the family estate at Longbourn, but this threat of the day Mr. Bennett will pass away is looming over them because then they'll have to leave Longbourn. But of course, a widow and her daughter is having to leave their home is exactly what happens in Sense and Sensibility. In the very beginning, we hear that the father has passed away, and so Mrs. Dashwood and her daughters have to make it by on Mrs. Dashwood's inheritance um, on a very small income. Um, another kind of alternate plot that struck me on this reread was how Mr. Bingley um, rents Netherfield, which is like a beautiful country house in the area. And we never hear anything about who the original owners of Netherfield are, but that in and of itself is an entire another story, another plot line, and one that Jane Austen explores in Persuasion, because in Persuasion, at the beginning of the novel, we meet a family that has to leave their ancestral estate because 
in Persuasion, Lord Elliot has gotten himself into terrible debts, and so he has to rent out Kellynch Hall, his estate. He has to retrench in order to be able to pay back his debts. Um, it's just fun to see the different threads and the different themes that Jane Austen picks up in these different novels, and sometimes the themes are just kind of there in the background, but other times she picks them up and really um, examines them and brings them to the front. I have done a character map of Pride and Prejudice. That was really, really fun. If you haven't caught it, I'll make sure I link it up above or in the description down below. I, mean, I am planning on doing some more Jane Austen character maps. I need to get back into those. Every time I pick up Jane Austen, I discover some new favorite line that I never noticed before. Her touch in writing is just so light. Like she makes all these little funny asides or just interesting observations that she weaves into her sentences and into the action so that you know, it doesn't even necessarily stand out. Like, it seems like she's just describing the action that's passing, but actually she's giving you a clue about the character and also maybe a little observation about people, how people in general are. I liked when, um, I liked when Jane and Lizzie are staying at Netherfield. Jane has been ill, but she's getting better, so now they're, they're going back to Longbourn. And the master of the house heard with real sorrow that they were to go so soon and repeatedly tried to persuade Miss Bennet that it would not be safe for her, that she was not enough recovered but Jane was firm where she felt herself to be right. That's a, a common thread for all Jane Austen heroines. Like, they might look meek on the outside, like Fanny Price from Mansfield Park. Like, sometimes people misjudge her and think she's kind of meek, but when it comes down to it, she sticks to her convictions, and she is firm when she feels herself to be right. I also liked when Mr. Collins is coming to visit, and Mrs. Bennet is angry because, because of the entail, because Mr. Collins is going to inherit instead of her daughter's. Jane and Elizabeth attempted to explain to her the nature of an entail. They had often attempted it before, but it was a subject on which Mrs. Bennet was beyond the reach of reason. <laughs> there are subjects like that for, for all of us where we're just, we don't want to hear it. We are beyond the reach of reason. It's kind of hilarious actually how Mrs. Bennet does not want to welcome Mr. Collins, but then uh, Mr. Bennet reads the letter and and in the letter Mr. Collins speaks kind of vaguely of how he wants to make amends for the fact that you know, um, the, the daughters will all be disinherited. And we hear that Mr. Collins' letter had done away much of her ill will, Mrs. Bennet's ill will, and she was prepared to see him with a degree of composure which astonished her husband and daughters. But see, I feel like Mrs. Bennet is more in the know than they realize because they don't know what kind of amends Mr. Collins is going to make, but Mrs. Bennet divines right away that he might be willing to marry one of her daughters, and I, that's why she's so calm. Well, that's about it for me. I hope you guys have enjoyed this reading wrap-up. I would love to hear what you've been reading. Down in the comments, definitely leave me some recommendations, some books you're planning to pick up this summer. I will link all the books that I've mentioned down in the description below. If you're not yet, make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for new videos every week. I'll talk to you again soon, and until then, I hope you have a magical day. Bye, guys!